Good morning. We'll give everyone about another minute to jump on and then we'll get started. Well, good morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started um, to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm Kelly Lane and I serve as the regional rep for Region 11 for DCA. And I have some of my colleagues on the call that I want to introduce real quick. Heather Sharp, she's the Region 10 rep. And Rebecca White, she serves as the Region 8 rep for DCA. And um, we have two guest speakers, Cherie Bennett and Amy Johnson. And um, Cherie, um, if every, just a few housekeeping, if everyone will um, keep their microphones muted and place their questions in the chat, um, and we'll have a time for questions at the end. So Cherie, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your screen and um, you and Amy can get started. Okay. All right. Do we, um, do you think we have time for people to introduce themselves? Because I see a few uh, current rural zone communities and then I see other folks just wondering where they're from. Sure. Anybody want to jump in? Georgia Henderson, Community Development Director, City of Douglas. Hey, Georgia, that's one of our rural zone communities. Hampton Rollerson, Charlton County. Callie Ray Little, I'm with the Cordial Crest Economic Development Council. So Cordial is one of our rural zones. <laughs> Nicole Acre with the Teller County Development Authority and Chamber. Hey, I'm Mandy White. I'm with Randolph County um, Chamber of Commerce and um, Development Authority. Stephanie Williams, Brooks County Development Authority. Mike Shelley Jacobs. Searcy, Cairo Main Street, Cairo, Georgia. Mike Jacobs, Southern Georgia Regional Commission. Hey, Mike. Lauren Nipper, Lauren. Homerville Main Street. That's one of our rural zone communities, as well as Cairo. Alyssa Fossil with Community Development, the City of Douglas. Good morning, I'm Suzanne Angel with Southwest Georgia Regional Commission. Courtney Hilliard, Moultrie, Cockwood County Development Authority. Do we get everybody? Does that sound like everybody, Heather? Kelly? We have one more in the chat. Brandy Avery with City of Thomasville is here. She said her microphone's not working today, but she's here okay. too. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for that. It's nice to know who I'm speaking with. So I am Cherie Bennett and I am the Rural Zone Program Manager for the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. Um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint just going over the basics of um, the Rural Zone Program and what the benefits are of the program. Talk a little bit about applying for a Rural Zone for those communities that haven't already applied. And then I'm going to turn it over to Amy Johnson, who is the Rural Zone team leader in Moultrie. Amy's doing a fabulous job down there promoting the Rural Zone tax credits um, and explaining it to folks. She has gotten a CPA involved to, to help when businesses have 
even deeper questions and um, has really done a good job down there and is going to show us some images of success stories that that she's had down there since they became a rural zone in 2021 amy is that right okay all right so i'm going to do my powerpoint it's pretty informal so feel free to jump in if you have questions can y'all see that i can't see you so say yes out loud if you can or can't not yet. Maybe no, it's churning. No, it's churning. Maybe it's churning to get up there. Okay. Hold on. Uh, it's telling me I've got to authenticate. Can you see it now? Not yet. No. Gee whiz. I'm sorry, y'all. It's up there, there now. Goes. You got Good it. heavens. Sorry, y'all. Okay. So let's get started. Just to give you a little bit of background on the Rural Zone Program, Rural is an acronym that stands for Revitalizing Underdeveloped Rural Areas Legislation. And it was signed into law back in May of 2017. And we had communities apply in the fall of 2017. And the first group of communities designated their um, rules on designation started in January of 2018. And the purpose of the program, the, the reason behind the program was to provide some incentives to try to help stimulate investment and job creation and economic development in struggling rural downtowns. And it provided three state tax incentives. The first one is the job tax credit. And this would be for a new business owner that comes in to a designated rural zone in a community and creates at least two new jobs or an existing business that's already within a designated rural zone that expands and hires at least two new employees. The investment tax credit is for investors that come in and purchase a building within the designated rural zone. And the rehab tax credit it's just for folks that have purchased a building and then decide that they need to do rehabilitation on the building, whether that be interior or exterior rehabilitation. So the first group of communities that uh, started in January 1 of 2018 are these nine communities. Um, each year, the uh, Commissioner of the Department of Economic Development and the Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Community Affairs can designate up to 10 communities. So this first year, nine communities were designated. And as you can see, um, the life of their zone lasted for five years. So these zones expired December 31st of 2022. They did a good job. This is a uh, graph showing how many businesses submitted rural zone certification forms. So that would be how many businesses um, basically signed up to utilize the tax credits in each of the communities. And um, so you can see in Bainbridge, for instance, 24 businesses were able to utilize the rural zone tax credits, whether that be um, for creating jobs, purchasing property, or doing rehab, or sometimes a combination of all three. Um, and you'll see also, if you look at Springfield, Springfield was only able, I think, to do about th only three businesses took advantage of the Rural Zone program, but I'll talk about Springfield in just a minute. But what we did see over that five-year period um, for these nine communities was that 
uh, the average vacancy rate for those nine communities that they submitted to us in their applications. So that would be before and that would be in 2017 before their life began in 2018. Their average vacancy rate was 26 percent. By the end of the five years, that vacancy rate was down to 13 percent. So that was an overall vacancy rate drop by 50 percent, which we definitely would say is, is a success for these nine communities. Um, individually, for instance, Cornelia's vacancy rate dropped from 37 to 20 percent. Springfield's dropped from 16 to 4. Perry's dropped from 30 to 2. And Bainbridge's dropped from 24 to 5 percent. So we were glad to see those. Um, interestingly, though, we had a, a follow up meeting at the beginning of 2023 to talk to these nine rural zones that you know had expired in 2022 to get um, information from them. And an interesting result that Springfield talked about, um, Aaron Phillips, who was the rural zone team leader there, shared that even though just a few businesses took advantage of the tax credits, the pr she think the, thinks the program was a success because it provided her with that conversation starter that she needed to talk about uh, down, coming into downtown and investing in downtown with prospects and developers. And she said that when they applied for Rural Zone designation, she had about 41 buildings that were vacant. And at the end, she only had two. So it was a success for her, even though only three businesses took advantage of the rural zone tax credits. And you may ask, well, why did not more businesses take advantage of tax credits when obviously businesses were moving into these vacant buildings? Well, you have to create at least two jobs and some businesses only created one job because they are small businesses. And the other thing is these have to be W-2 uh, jobs that receive W-2 and pay income tax to the state. And sometimes um, they were 1099 jobs. So those those did not count. But overall, a, a success in Springfield, even though they weren't able to or businesses weren't able to use the tax credits. We're now at the sixth round of rural zone communities. And these are the seven rural zones that whose life started January 1 of 2023. And again, their life will last for five years. Um, we just received applications back in August for the round of communities whose designation will start January 1 of 2024, and those will be announced in October. So here's what we're looking like right now, um, all 43 rural zones, and we've got great representation from Region 10 and 11, so I'm very proud of that and glad to be talking to some of y'all that haven't applied yet but might be considering it because um, there's still several communities under 15,000 in population that, that are eligible in these two regions. But basically, there are 12 currently rural zones in Region 10 and 11, and that is um, about 28% of all the rural zones around the state. So good, good representation, 10 and 11. So the Rural Zone Program goals are to assist in revitalizing rural downtowns by offering these incentives, right, for job creation and investment and business activities. And as I said, it offers three Georgia state income tax credits, the job tax credit, the investment tax credit, and the rehab tax credit. What's a tax credit? I get that question a lot. A tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction of the amount of income tax that you owe. And tax credits are generally going to save you more money in taxes than a deduction would, because deductions are only going to reduce the amount of your income that is subject to tax, whereas the credits are going to directly be subtracted off the amount that you owe. The key thing I want you to remember about the rural zone tax credits, though, is that job creation is the key to unlocking all three of those rural zone tax credits. Um, so investment and rehab, you still have to have the job creation. A couple of other things to keep in mind that this is a state of Georgia income tax credit. This is not a federal tax credit. These tax credits, unlike other tax credits available in the state, cannot be sold or transferred. Um, the rural zone tax credits are non-refundable. And non-refundable means that if uh, you have excess at the end of paying your taxes, you're not going to get a refund check from the 
Georgia Department of Revenue. Instead, those credits will just be carried forward for up to 10 years for you to use against your income taxes. And this program is not just for new businesses that decide to locate in your downtown, but can also be for the expansion of existing businesses. So let's start with the job tax credit. So if your community is designated as a rural zone, then a business would be able to receive the job tax credit as long as they create at least two new jobs. And again, these jobs do have to receive W-2s. They have to be paying um, in uh, uh, payroll taxes. The job tax credit equals $2,000 per new full-time equivalent job. And what is an FTE? A full-time equivalent job means that you can add together employees' hours working um, 40 hours a week. That means you can add together part-time employees' hours to equal 40 hours a week. So you might have, for instance, four part-time workers that are only working 10 hours per week. But times 10 hours, that would be 40 hours or one FTE. So those four part-time workers would equal one FTE. And this is great because in our other job tax credit programs, you have to have full-time employees that are each working 35 hours plus a week. So this helps you, um, helps small businesses that have a lot of part-time workers get credit for those workers. So eligible businesses that can take this tax credit will include those with these NAICS codes that you see listed. And we have a list of eligible NAICS codes, but they are basically those kinds of jobs that you would want to see locate within your downtown. So doctor's offices, a cupcake shop, a brewery, restaurant, gift shops, a bed and breakfast, a bank, um, um, just offices in general and law offices. This credit cannot exceed $40,000 per year, so it would not give a credit um, for over 20 jobs created by that downtown business. And the credit can be taken for five years as long as the jobs are maintained by that small business. All right. Sorry, so let's go back. Right, so. <laughs> so, for instance, if um, and can everybody mute their mic because I'm hearing I'm hearing somebody. Um, so two thousand uh, dollars credit. Let's say somebody hires two new employees times two thousand. That would be a four thousand dollar credit on their state income taxes the first year. And then as long as those two jobs are maintained for five years, the business would be able to take the four thousand dollar credit each year for five years. Any questions on the job tax credit? I think the main thing to keep in mind is that we're looking for, for two jobs on that. You have to meet that two job creation threshold in order to qualify for the job tax credit, but also in order to qualify for the rehab credit and the investment credit. And that's why I had the slide that said job creation really is key for this. The next credit is the investment tax credit. So this is going to be when somebody comes in and purchases a building in your downtown. It's going to be equal to 25% of the purchase price of the building, not to exceed 125,000. It would be have to would have to be purchased after January 1 of the year that the community's designation begins. Um, and an eligible business must be located in that investment property and create and maintain a minimum of two full-time equivalent jobs. So with this one, um, let's say a developer comes in, purchases a building, and it just sits. Would he then be eligible for the investment tax credit? The answer is no. He would need to purchase the building and then either himself put a business in that building that creates at least two new jobs or lease out the property to a business that creates at least two jobs. And then the developer would be eligible for the income tax credit. This credit has to be prorated equally over five installments. Um, in five installments over five tax years, beginning with the year that the property is placed in service. 
Any questions on the investment tax credit? Okay, we'll move on to the rehab tax credit. So this is gonna be equal to 30% of qualified rehab costs not to exceed 150,000. And qualified rehab costs under this program are labor and material costs. This credit has to be prorated over three installments um, over three tax years, beginning with the year the property's put in service. And with this one, the taxpayer cannot use the same qualified rehab cost to generate any other additional state income tax credit. So, for instance, if uh, the developer or the bu building owner is going after the Historic Preservation Division state income tax credits for rehabbed properties, um, they would need to just do that. They can't basically they can't double dip and get both. So you could run the numbers to see which one would be um, financially most beneficial to the business and then go with that one. Also, we have a list of 10 rehab standards that do need to be followed. So if if a property that's being rehabilitated within um, a local rural zone is also located within a designated local historic district, then we can accept um, a COA or a certificate of appropriateness that has been issued by the Historic Preservation Commission saying that that the work uh, being proposed will meet the rehab standards. If a rural zone project is not located within a local district, so it's not under the purview of a Historic Preservation Commission, then we would need to review any work done on the exterior of the building prior to work being done. So these are the standards that we have. Um, basically, it's saying um, if I had to boil these all down to uh, something very simple, it's that the historic character of a property should be retained and preserved. So you're trying to preserve as much of the uh, historic details and materials as possible. We don't want to see sandblasting because that actually causes damage to bricks um, and they can crumble after sandblasting, so we wouldn't want to do that. Um, any new additions need to be secondary to the original building, that kind of thing. A question I often get is, can the three rules on tax credits be stacked? Can they be combined? Yes, they can. And here's an example down in Bainbridge that y'all may be familiar with. If you've been to downtown Bainbridge, this is the Fleming Building built in 1880. Sits on the uh, downtown courthouse square. And um, this is the interior of the building before rehab began, nearing completion. And then after rehabs, what it looks like very successful um, brewing company. And they were able to take advantage of all the tax credits. So they created three jobs times $2,000. That's a $6,000 tax credit per year. They paid $41,000 for the building. So 25% of that is $10,250. And then they spent around seventy thousand in renovation costs, so that's another twenty thousand nine hundred and ten in tax credits. And so their first year of tax credits, uh, it equaled fifteen thousand twenty, and then uh, over the five year period, they could earn up to sixty one thousand one hundred and sixty dollars in tax credits. And sometimes for a small business, there might not be enough um, liability for that business to utilize all those tax credits. But like I said, anything that's unused can be carry forward for up to 10 years by the business to use against future years income tax liability. So any questions about um, the tax credits before I move on to the eligibility of communities who are thinking about applying? Anything in the chat, Heather or Kelly? Also, please feel free to utilize the chat if you'd rather not um, ask me out loud. We don't have any questions so far in the chat, but as um, Sheree said, please drop those in. If you want us, even if you think it's something now and you want us to come back at the end and address that, we could definitely do that. You can drop that in. 
All right, well, I'll move on to um, speak to those communities that don't already have rural zone designation. So you just missed the deadline for um, this coming up here. So those applications were due mid-August, but the applications for a community's designation that will start January 1 of 2025, those will also be due mid-August of 2024. So I don't foresee us changing the applications very much. So you can go online and uh, look up Rural Zone and click on the link to our applications to see what's expected in our applications um, and get a good idea of that. Many communities work with their regional commission um, to put together their application. And uh, some communities also work with their um, their um, Electric Membership Corp Corporation, their EMC or ECG, to help with their plans and their leakage study and their application. So keep that in mind. Um, and always, of course, if you're interested in it, talk to um, to Heather and Kelly about putting together an application, and they can always put, point you in the right direction for resources. So cities and counties with a population of less than 15,000 people are those that would be eligible. Um, and we are using the five-year average by the American Community Survey for population. So if you're wondering what we're looking at, that's what that's what we go by for seeing what a community's population is. Um, the community or the, the city must have a concentration of historic commercial structures that are at least 50 years old within the zone. So we're looking at your historic downtown commercial district. Um, and by historic, we mean buildings that are at least 50 years old. So we're looking for that concentration of historic commercial buildings. And then within the application, you need to prove economic distress. So that could be based on your poverty rate, uh, the vacancy rate of your downtown area, and or blight, or some communities, of course, have all three of those. So um, those are things that are numbers that we ask you to um, provide for us in the application. The city or the county does need to be in compliance with state requirements regarding things like comp planning and reporting and service delivery strategy. Um, they must be up to date on their uh, GOMI report and their report of local government finances. Again, if you have any questions about whether or not your community is in compliance with any of those, you can always ask Heather um, or Kelly or me. And then within the application, and the reason that um, Kelly and Heather asked me to speak now is because if you don't already have a downtown master plan uh, or strategic plan or a market analysis, starting right now, we're in September, um, it, this is going to give you time to work on that kind of study between now and when the applications are due in August. So these two things are required to be to accompany your application, and that's a feasibility study or market analysis or leakage report that identifies which types of business activities could be supported within your proposed rural zone. So. What types of businesses could be supported within your downtown that aren't already there? And then a master plan or a strategic plan for your downtown that outlines goals and uh, clear action steps for revitalizing your downtown area. So those are the two things that are required. We also have um, an application that, that asks questions, but many of those questions are based on some of the information that you can find in your master plan or, or downtown strategic plan. As I said, the next Rural Zone application deadline is going to be mid-August of 2024, and this is my contact information in case you want to ask me questions. One thing also to keep in mind is that um, if you can get me your draft application prior to August the 1st, I will be glad to take a look at your application and give you some ideas on ways to, to strengthen the application, um, things to add, things to take out possibly um, that will help you score higher um, on the scoring once we do that. So just an option that a lot of people don't take advantage of. Some people don't ask me to look at their application and I wish they would. So um, just know that that's an offer um, on the table. Any questions on applying for rural zone designation?
Hi there, this is Hampton Rollerson in Charlton. If a county were to apply, I assume it would apply countywide, even in the incorporated areas, if successful. Or would it only be in the unincorporated areas? Do you, um, do you have a county that's less than 15,000 in population? Yes, ma'am. We're somewhere between 12 and a half to 13,000. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it's a possibility that we could do that um, and you could include the municipalities um, as long as they're in agreement, but we'd still want to see some kind of a master plan um, yeah, for all the different areas where there is a concentration of commercial. So I don't think it would be. I don't think it would be where we would designate the entire county. It would probably be in nodes, co commercial nodes. So does it, that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So it would be possible to do specific sections or locations within the county. It wouldn't have to be relegated just once one specific location. Right. OK. But it would need to be historic you know, a concentration of historic commercial buildings in each of those nodes. Right. Any other questions? Anything in the chat, y'all? All right, well, yeah, I'm going... Somewhere. I'm going to turn it over to Amy Johnson. As I said, she is the Rural Zone team leader in downtown Moultrie and for the Moultrie Rural Zone. And she's going to talk about some of the successes that she's had with the program since uh, they started back in 2021. Amy, I'm pulling it up right now. Your slides. Can y'all see that? It says downtown Moultrie. We can. Okay. Am I Amy, muted? can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So good morning. Um, I didn't know uh, how many of you knew or had been to Moultrie, um, but this is just a, a front slide just to kind of tell you who we are. We're located um, South Georgia. We're in the middle of, um, of Thomasville's to our south, Tipton's to the north. Valdosta's to the east and Albany's to the west. So we're right in the middle of all those great, the great cities. So uh, just to give you an idea of where we're located. Um, the, for many years, we have been concentrating on the center of our downtown and we, we have a courthouse square, which we do all of our activities and a lot of things surrounds that and we we promote that all the time, but this rule zone actually gave us the opportunity to not only grow that area, but to go to the distressed areas, which are basically sometimes right behind um, the, the pretty areas. So we, and um, when we did our application, we really looked at the area on the map to see where we wanted to, uh, where we needed, to make things better. So we took our, incorporated our, what we call our warehouse district, where we have a, a lot of um, tobacco warehouses and just an area that's not pretty. You know, you've got a lot, of, a lot of dilapidated things. And so we wanted to include that area. So um, what we did uh, with the help of the other communities, when we did our application, um, we, Look, you know, got help from Bainbridge, Adale, and just kind of looked at some of those communities that had uh, gotten approval and um, talked to them to see um, how they were doing things. And then um, we uh, decided who needed to be on our team, and we uh, brought in a CPA, which is basically on the same block as me, but he got real excited about this program. And he had a lot of clients that could utilize this program. And he got real, when I say he really got excited about it, he really did. So that let me know how important this program was. Although I had seen what it could do in other communities, it really helped me um, know what it could do. So 
I'll just go over a, a few things, a um, few projects that we've done in our community. Right, I'm sorry, my phone keeps going off. Um, we have had about 10 projects so far um, that have done the application, and a couple of those are developers, and I'll show you how that how that was incorporated in just a minute. And then we have about four other projects that we are, uh, that's ongoing right now that we hope to get the paperwork done by the end of the year so that they can be included as well. And then we have two that just really, they should get the tax credits. Um, and one of them's corporate and they just, they just didn't get back with me with their, their code, you know, and, and you can't, push something that doesn't want to happen. So um, that was a very interesting um, thing that happened to me. So anyway, the very first project, this wasn't the first project, but this is a very interesting project that happened. This is on our courthouse square. It's an old building, it's 30,000 square feet. It's two story. And um, we, we said, what, what are we going to do with this building? It, it sat vacant for many years. And we had a very successful boutique that had opened down the street a few years prior, about five years prior. It's called the Flossy Peach. And she knew she wanted to expand, but she didn't know where. So she um, was able to see that we were really trying to do something with this building and do something really good with it. We had the rules on that had kicked off. She didn't really know how beneficial the rules on was, was going to be, but her CPA is the same CPA that joined our group that said, hey, this is important. You don't understand what this could do for you. So at the same time, even though she's an existing business, her sister was starting a new insurance company. So what happened here is this building was uh, purchased by an LLC of the two sisters. Now there's the before, and I'll go. You can go to the the after screen. So the two sisters bought this in an LLC. So they did the investment, which was purchase the property for seventy eight thousand dollars. Caught they'd spent six hundred fifty seven thousand renovating it. Now the four new jobs came from the the insurance company because that was the new business. The Flossy Peach was an existing business, therefore. Um, if they added jobs that could that could count on the rules on, they had to have those new jobs for the majority of the year. And so we were able to use the state farms new job creation because she was a brand new business. So you can see how this turned out. It's beautiful. The sisters split it right down the middle. Um, the upstairs, uh, they do have plans to do something with the upstairs. But it has really, it really started renovation and really started uh, a lot of things behind that area, which is distressed. Um, there's a brewery uh, right now under construction. And because of the brewery, a young couple came and bought another building that's next to that. They're renovating it and they're going to um, lease it out. And there's just a lot of, of um, we've got a lot of people coming in now asking about what's available. What do you have? I want to bring my business. Let me see what you have. So we probably have more of that going on right now than I have ever seen. And I've been here 24 years. So I think a lot of it we can contribute to the rules on helping us. So the next project is a very neat project. This building uh, was owned by our Downtown Development Authority, and uh, there was a time when the owners before the DDA got a hold of it, basically they were looking at it like, we're going to have to tear this building down. And so the DDA said, you know what, if we don't do something with this building, nobody else is, and we cannot put a hole in the middle of our square. So uh, the DDA was able to uh, take funds um, and put a new roof on it. And then we found a developer. 
and the developer uh, was able to come in and, and we signed a lease with that developer. And the only way that uh, we would agree to work with this developer, he agreed to put in 10 loft apartments upstairs and he had to put some type of retail or uh, job creation downstairs. We knew that's what we wanted. So he had had a track record with us, and so we knew this would work. So not only did he put 10 loft apartments in the top, he put two on the bottom back. They're not storefront. They're not in the front. They're in the very back. So the developer was not able to get tax credits with the apartments alone because he was not creating jobs. But what he did do once the jobs were created downstairs, he could then, in fact, take those tax credits for his renovation and then the jobs that were created downstairs that would help him to be able to get those tax credits. So not only was the developer able to take renovation tax credits, the two new businesses downstairs, which there's a medical spa, on the left spa that is beautiful, and then there is Baba's on the right hand side, which is it started out as a coffee shop, but they're doing lunch, they're doing special events. They're just, it's a really cool spot. And I can't tell you what this building has done to our downtown, just bringing people in. It is fantastic. The, uh, the apartment's rented right away. In fact, he had one, uh, there's many times that he has, he'll have an opening. He'll say, well, you put it on Facebook and then he'll call me back and says, take it off, take it off. We're getting too many calls. So it's, it's been a really good thing for our downtown. So we were able to, uh, all three different entities were able to take advantage of this tax credit. Of a, tax, of a tax credit. The spa, they put in $36,000 of their own money and they created three jobs. Now they were not able to get that rehab tax unless they created those three jobs. So their total tax credits total, you'll see what that is, 40,800. The restaurant, which is Baba's or the coffee shop, she put $21,000 of her own money in and she created, she actually has created more than three jobs, but that was the initial uh, so her tax credits, you'll see what her tax credits are. And then the developer, he spent, um, you see what he spent. He actually probably spent more than that, but that's just what he put on paper. And so you see his tax credits for the renovations. So um, very, very uh, positive thing for us. Both of those two buildings were very positive. Um, you can go on down. Our property tax values, you'll see uh, since 2021, they've started, they're going up. And I contribute that to several things, but a lot of it I think is just the, uh, the, the good things that's in the air of what's happening. When people see construction, when they see things happening, it creates a buzz and people don't wanna, what I'm seeing now, people don't wanna miss out. So I just, I can't say enough about how this is really, we're almost over. The other good thing about this is what I'll say is this, it is a fantastic thing to put in our toolbox because when you combine the rule zone with the DDRLF, which is the low interest uh, loans, or the Georgia Cities Foundation's low interest loans, and your facade grants, and there's some of the SSBCI money out there, and there's energy rebates, it really makes a significant difference. So those are just really great things that you can put out there to your investors or anybody looking to open a business. Our current project is this right here. This is the old theater. We call I call it the old theater building. It housed our senior citizens for many years until COVID, and then uh, it ceased to exist. Now, what's unique about this building on the inside it still has the slanted floor like uh, it did when the theater was still there. But during the renovation, they went in and put a floor on top of that slanted floor. So if we ever wanted to go back and, and put it back as a theater, that floor is still there. There is a fantastic large commercial kitchen in there because it was a Meals on Wheels for multiple counties. And so that was a very positive thing. The city owned this building. They gave it to the Downtown Development Authority. 
we in turn have worked and uh, we have a tenant that we're working with right now um, that when they start construction and when they open, they'll be able to take advantage of the tax credits. They'll be able to take the renovation tax credits and the job tax credits. Um, and the DDA is working out something with them where they'll be able to own it because they're going to put in a significant amount of money. So I'll show you what it's supposed to look like when it's finished. That's what it's supposed to look like when it's finished. So there is a lot of large projects that I would say because of the rules on have helped us get there. Very small steps. The very first rule zone project we did was just one of our little boutiques that they added jobs. And then it just started going from there. And then the next slide, um, uh, the completed projects you'll see, I think there are actually one, two, three. There's eight, I think, listed there. Three, eight. But what's not there is the developer of the belt cuts and lofts that I showed you an appliance store that, that I didn't put on there in First National Bank, and I just um, admitted them because I was trying to come up with a list really quick, and I missed them. So at the bottom, you'll see there is a uh, other current projects that will be rules on projects. We have a brewery that's happening. It's right behind that Flossy Peach building I showed you where things are starting to happen. Um, called Brand Bandwagon Brewery. They already have the Instagram, so follow them on Instagram. Olivia Ray's, it's going to be a very nice uh, boutique. They purchased a building and they've done a lot of renovations to it. And I think she's opening at the end of this month. A med spa is, uh, they're going to be, this is our second med spa, but this is, they're going to be offering more things than our other med spa. They've Purchased a building, did a complete renovation, adding a lot of jobs. So they'll be able to take uh, advantage of that. But they're also like taking advantage of, of like the energy rebate and so the facade grants and some other things. And then, of course, what's happening at the theater. So the only downfall I could think of this program and that is that it's not longer than five years, because I believe that if we had 10 years, we could. Do a lot. Anyway, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call me or come over to see us. And, and you know, I just thank thank DCA to, for doing the rules on because it's really helped us. And and I can't wait to see what's going to happen by the end of 2025 when we have to say goodbye to the rules on. Yeah, I can't wait to see either. And thank you, Amy, for doing such a great job down there. Um, cause it really, what we have seen over the years is that in those communities where there isn't, um, a champion that gets out there and talks this program up and promotes it, um, businesses don't know about it. And so they don't take advantage of the tax credits, but Amy's done a great job of promoting it there in Moultrie. So thanks for all your hard work. Um, one thing I will say, and Cherie probably, uh, you know, probably talked a lot and she was probably like oh my goodness Amy I keep hearing from Amy but we we kept having meetings at our welcome center where we would invite the public and we did it with you all one time through zoom I think we did it twice with y'all and then our CPA Jeff took your program and did it again so we had three or four different rules on info sessions now we might have had three or four people attend those but every time they were three or four different people so um that helps get the word out too right yeah and that's that's another thing amy is amy didn't just promote it the first year She's continued to promote it every year because you have new uh, new folks move into town that may not have heard heard about it. And so she hasn't just rested on her laurels and um, stuck some info on the website and hope people get it. She's still talking it up. You and that's to. the thing you're going to yeah. have to do. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Amy or any questions for me um, on the Rural Zone program specifically? before I move on to talk about Downtown Development Revolving Loan Fund. Anything in the chat, Ms. Heather? This is a quiet group. They've not it's even a had very any chat questions. It's a very um, quiet probably, group, maybe because it's Monday. 
they're probably going to take, they're going to think about everything that Amy said. They're going to call her later. So um, <laughs> that's yeah. a very generous offer. <laughs> blow, blow her phone up. All right. Well, if there's nothing, then I will share my screen again and do another presentation. All right. Are y'all seeing that screen? Yes, we, we can see it. Okay. All right. So I'm also the program manager for the Downtown Development Revolving Loan Fund Program. And you heard Amy mention that some businesses in her downtown have taken advantage of the DDRLF program. Um, it's a low interest program, low interest program, um, loan program to help businesses in your historic downtown core. Um, it is a gap financing program. So that's something to keep in mind. If you have a very savvy business owner that could go to any bank and get any amount of a loan from that bank, then this would not be the program um, for that person. This is more to help a business that's struggling a little bit, they've gone to a bank, um, but the bank is not willing to loan them the full amount that they need to renovate or start a business in their downtown. Um, so they would then come to us to help them fill the gap. And the benefits and opportunity uh, of the DDRLF program is we do offer that low interest rate. We're in a subordinated debt position to the private bank financing, and we can offer some technical assistance. The business or project needs to be located within the core historic downtown commercial district or the adjacent historic neighborhood where maybe there are historically residential properties that now have been rezoned commercial. All right, so you know those neighborhoods that are right there touching the downtown and commercial is starting to move into those residential homes and maybe be a spa or a doctor's office or a law office or something like that. So DDRLF could could help those projects too. What we can't do is something that's, you know, out on the bypass. So think about downtown um, and your core historic downtown when you think about DDRLF. And cities or counties with populations under 100,000 are eligible for this program. Typical eligible activities that we can help with are uh, land acquisition. So if there is a vacant lot in your downtown, we can help with the purchase of that land. Building acquisition. So this would be an existing building in your downtown. Uh, developers coming in and wanting to purchase that. New construction or infill development. Maybe they want to build a new building on that vacant property that they acquired. We could help with that. The renovation of existing buildings and any combination of the above. I would say more often than not, I mean, probably 90% of what we do is assisting with the acquisition of a historic building in a downtown and then the renovation of that building to make it ready for a new business to come in. Ineligible activities would be we cannot um, provide money for working capital or operating expenses, and we can't help with the refinancing of a permanent loan. Um, we can't pay for loan administration, and we cannot fund a local revolving loan fund. Some of the types of projects that we have assisted with over the years, law office in downtown Noonan, Empire South Clothing Store in downtown Hartwell, Scoops Ice Cream Shop in downtown Metter, although I think they have closed, so I need to take that off. Um, co-working space in downtown Canton, the fitness studio, Lift Fitness Studio in downtown Bainbridge, Story on the Square Bookshop in downtown McDonough, Fuzzy Goat Yarn Shop in downtown Thomasville, and mixed use spaces, including retail and apartments in downtown Dublin and Statesboro. So we can help with a variety of projects. Thing just to keep in mind is that we are that gap financing program. Our typical loan terms are 3% um, interest rate, but for Main Street communities that are in good standing with the program, um, and these are classic Main Street communities and GEMS communities, not affiliates um, or starters, 
I think that's what they're called now. Um, so it has to be a classic or a gym would be eligible for the 2% rate as long as they're in good standing with the program and up to date on all their reporting. The repayment period would be a 15 years and it's 15 year term with 15 year amortization. We do not um, apply any fees or charge any fees um, for our loans. And the application is it must be made by the DDA. So the official applicant is the downtown development authority of that community. That's because DCA as a state agency can't make a loan directly to a private individual. So the DDA serves as the conduit for these funds. So at loan closing, the DCA loans the money directly to the DDA, and then simultaneously the DDA loans it to the business, or as we call it, the sub borrower. Our maximum loan amount is 250,000, but it cannot exceed 40% of the total eligible costs. Minimum loan amount is 50,000, so that means a, a project that has total cost of 125,000. So we couldn't do any less than that. And then typically our loans are structured this way. Um, we do require an equity in injection of 10%. So typically the bank comes in at 50%. We fill the gap, um, the DDRF loan fills the gap of 40%, and then we do require that owner equity at 10% of total project costs. Successful DDRLF applications definitely have to demonstrate that gap in financing. So we will ask for um, the bank's commitment letter to see what they're willing to put into the project to show if show us that there is um, that gap. We want to see that the project will fit into the community's plans for downtown revitalization. So we ask in the application um, and the DD, DDA needs to let us know how it fits in there. Oftentimes DDAs just cut and paste from their plan, some of their goals from their downtown revitalization plan that this particular project um, would help meet, you know, like job creation, revitalization of a blighted building, that kind of thing. So we would want to see that the city is definitely backing this. And of course, we see that because the DDA is putting together this application and submitting it. And um, also the mayor and the DDA chair have to sign off on the application. We want to see that the project will have a positive impact on downtown. So we want to see that the project is going to create jobs. So that adds foot traffic into downtown. We want to see that it's going to create a new business for downtown, or perhaps it's an expansion of a successful existing business in downtown. Um, we love to see those projects that take a blighted building and rehab the building. So and completely remove that blighted building um, from the downtown inventory and then put an active business in it. Even better would be when you have retail on the bottom and the developer goes in and puts apartments on the second floor. So then you've got um, even more foot track it, traffic and you've got a downtown now that has um, presence of people for 24 hours a day rather than just eight to five. So those are really exciting projects when we when we see a blighted building um, taken to be one that um, can help the downtown so much. We want to see that the project is feasible and sound. Um, so we do ask for things like um, business plans. We want to see um, estimates um, from the construction company on what the rehab's going to cost. We ask for projections and that kind of thing. So we will ask for all of those things as part of the application process. And then we do have an underwriting department that he, that's here at DCA. And so the borrower will go through credit underwriting. So the borrower does need to be credit worthy. The applications for this program are accepted year round and they're available at DCA's website under downtown development revolving loan fund program. We have um, a pre-application and a full application. So the pre-application we call the initial project assessment and at that point that's telling us the basic information about the program. Uh, the other thing we require at the point of IPA is that our DCA regional rep, and so for 
10 and 11, that's going to be Heather and Kelly. And then for Region 8, that's going to be Rebecca. The business would need and the DDA would need to ask them to make a site visit. So an initial project assessment site visit where they come and look at the building um, and then they write up a report on that building um, and they submit that. And that's also part of that pre-application process. So that needs to be done. Also, they can walk the business owner through the process of DDRLF and talk them through exactly how the program is going to work. One of the things that um, often comes up in that initial project assessment is that our loans do not close until project completion. So they don't close until a certificate of occupancy has been issued for that building. And so that's one thing that throws some people that are looking for funding on the front end. We don't offer that money. Um, instead, though, oftentimes what can happen is if the bank has agreed to provide 50 percent of, of the total project cost and we approve an application for the other 40 percent, then oftentimes the bank is willing to loan the, the business a temporary loan or a construction loan um, just to get them through the renovation stage until our loan kicks in and then we have our loan closing and that money is used to pay down that temporary loan. So something to keep in mind is that our loan closes on the back end, not the front end. Any questions about the application process or the DDRLF before I show you some examples? Again, y'all are quite group. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you about uh, two projects that we've done in Covington. This is the Mystic Grill uh, located on the downtown Courthouse Square. It was built in 1906. And if you're a fan of the Vampire Diaries TV series, then you know uh, the facade of this building. So it served as the primary facade prop for that television series as the, the Mystic Grill. And with the success of that program, um, I'm sorry, with the success of that TV show, two couples in the downtown decided to um, take advantage of that success and people coming into Covington looking for something that had to do with the Vampire Diaries. And they decided to buy the building and renovate it um, to play off the success of the TV show. So the building was renovated as a restaurant and event space um, that looks very similar to the one portrayed in the show. The, the bar here it, um, is actually a replica of the one from the TV show. And there's a great rooftop bar that overlooks the historic courthouse square. Um, and this is how the financing for this went down. Um, you can see it was a $1.8 million project and DDRLF came in at our maximum amount, 250000 The Georgia Cities Foundation, which is our um, sister loan, came in at another 250000 So some, for some of these larger projects, DDRLF and GCF um, both come in. GCF is um, a foundation through the Georgia Municipal Authority, and our underwriters actually do the underwriting for Georgia cities. So sometimes we do projects together, sometimes we do them separate. But just another um, resource for you if you're out there looking for funding for downtown renovation work. Newton Federal Bank, the local bank, came in at $840,000, and then the two couples put forth $450,000 in owner equity. And you can see over here on the right how the, the money was used. But it's been a very, very successful restaurant. Um, <laughs> in addition to having food sales and, of course, alcohol sales as revenue streams, they also have a gift shop in the basement. It's now called The Alley. Um, it's where you can go and look at some of the props and costumes from the various television shows that are filmed there. So the vampires, the originals, and... I think there's another couple that have been filmed there now that I, for some reason, I can't think of the names. If you know the names and the other TV shows that have been filmed there, holler out. But um, so they are also able to sell Vampire Diaries t-shirts and sweatshirts and all of that kind of stuff um, to make extra money down in the basement. 
it is a very popular location. If you've ever tried to go there, you know, there's it's always packed. There's always um, a line outside and it's just been a catalyst for the rest of the downtown. Um, it created 40 jobs in the downtown. It renovated this building um, that, again, if you look at it here after it's been renovated, um, versus what it looked like before. Also, there had been a fire in the building, so um, the renovation of this was really um, key to downtown revitalization because it sat on a prominent corner in the downtown courthouse square. And it was a catalyst for other restaurants coming into the downtown area, including the City Pharmacy, which we also helped out in downtown Covington. This is right across the street from Mystic Grill. Um, City Pharmacy was actually used as a pharmacy for many, many years, um, constructed in 1937. Um, this is not a great picture, but I had to use it because it had the General Lee out front. If y'all remember the Dukes of Hazzard, um, was filmed in <laughs> part of it was filmed in Covington. Um, and, or maybe the pilot was filmed in Covington. But anyway, I thought that was hilarious. So it was used as the city pharmacy up until about the 70s or 80s. Um, and it then was used as a coffee shop, had sat vacant for a while, and now it is the City Pharmacy Restaurant, which is a 65-seat restaurant and bar that serves um, Southern food and specially mixed drinks. They've created 35 jobs in downtown. This is what it looked like before renovation work began in the interior, and this is what it looks like now. And here's how the financing went for this. Again, this was another one where DDRLF and GCF both came in with 250,000, United Bank for 551,000, and then owner equity of 570,000. So $1.6 million project, but a great project for, for downtown Covington. All right, and that's what I have on DDRLF. Do y'all have any questions for me? We don't have any questions. In the chat, but we have lots of suggestions for shows to check out. In fact, Alyssa has dropped in a whole list of shows that were filmed in Covington. Um, and then Rebecca suggested Sweet Mail is also. So they're not asking questions about this, but they do have some shows on their watch list now. <laughs> Good to know. And I've also eaten at the Mystic Grill and uh, City Pharmacy. Both are excellent. So head over to Covington. And they also do Vampire Diary tours. So very, I mean, if you're there, you will see the tour groups and the um, the trolleys and that kind of thing that carry around tourists. All right, Kelly and Heather, I'll turn it back over to y'all. Well, again, if you have questions about this, please reach out to your regional rep and we can connect you with a program director or we can connect you with another community um, with a professional like Amy who has walked through this, maybe has some advice or some ideas. Um, we'd be happy to connect you, I mean, with any of these people that would be useful. If you're looking at uh, the rules on application, let's talk about that. And then if you're interested in the DDRLF, let's put together a meeting or a site visit so we can talk more with you and the potential business owner about that. Uh, if you do have questions again reach out we are going to record or we are recording today and we'll try to get that up on our youtube page it takes a little while um, but we'll get working on that soon did have one come in while i was while i was closing the meeting we have another one um clarification on tax credits for the rural zone um so the need i know that each credit is prorated for certain time periods am i right that any excess accrued will be applied against income tax owed for up to 10 years until credit is resolved that's right. That's right. So the easy answer is yes, that's right. Um, to get down in the weeds, just remember that if that, um, if say the investment tax credit is prorated over five years, then um, it's, it wouldn't, this would, this would go forward for 10 years beyond this year. This would go 10 years beyond this one, 10 years beyond this one, 10 years beyond this one, and 10 years beyond this one. So it could be up to like 15 years out. Um, able to continuing to use it because they the tax credits are accruing each year for five years on the investment tax credit each year for three years on the rehab tax credit. Is that clear as mud, Alyssa? 
She okay, said you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Well, guys, if there are no more questions, we thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you so much to Cherie and Amy for um, presenting, and I hope that everyone has a great day. Bye, y'all.